This video includes two crime stories based on actual crimes committed and solved. If we can learn from these two stories, we will be educated instead of just entertained. I like the following quote from Bernard Malamud in The Natural, we have two lives. The life we learn with, and the life we live after that. I always say, ignorance is expensive. So I learn about things that may negatively affect me or my family. With this in mind, I edit and watch my videos as if I am the victim in the story. I watch and look for the warning signs that led up to the crime. Then I consider what I would do to prevent this type of crime from happening to me or to someone in my family. By staying informed and educated about actual life-ending crimes, I can move from being paranoid to being prepared. If you have not already, I recommend developing your own strategy to keep your family safe. January 12, 2003. It's a chilly Sunday afternoon in Meridian, Idaho, a charming community just outside Boise. Following a post-church lunch, 21-year-old Amber Thorngren pulls into the driveway of her parents' modest three-bedroom home. She thought that dad came home from church and did his usual routine. He would always go wash his hands. He put his Bible on the bed. He usually changed his clothes. And then ate. He would eat his lunch and play crossword puzzles that night. That's where you'd find him on Sunday. But as Amber enters the home, she encounters a scene that's straight out of a horror movie. Amber had walked in the house, and then she saw dad's legs. As she approaches, she notices blood coming out of his nose and ears. He's unresponsive. Amber dials 911 and informs the operator that her father, 42-year-old Kurt Thorngren, may have had an accident. She's screaming on the phone. That dad fell, and she couldn't get him up. She said he hit his head. He had passed out or something. We obviously all respond there with medics and fire trucks. But once they're inside the bathroom, there's little first responders can do. He is pronounced dead at the scene. It's also clear to police and EMTs that Kurt Thorngren's death was no accident. He was shot in the mouth. Do we have a suicide? Do we have a, a homicide? We didn't know. Kurt Thorngren and his wife Donna had carved out an idyllic life for themselves in rural Idaho. The couple had raised three children in Meridian, the same small town where both Kurt and Donna grew up. Like most of his peers, as a young man, Kurt wasn't drawn to outdoorsy pursuits. Instead, Kurt preferred screen time over fly rods and shotguns. Kurt was a computer geek. He was a computer guy. He wasn't into hunting and fishing and doing those types of things. But building homemade hard drives and playing video games wasn't Kurt's only passion. Kurt loved God. Very religious guy. He would go to church every Sunday. It's completely who Kurt was. He was smart and he would be there for anybody. He was just a good guy. There was nothing anybody could ever say bad about him. He was just a sweetheart. And it was at church that Kurt realized he was falling in love with an attractive, kind-hearted 19-year-old named Donna Kay. From kids to up through high school, they were in choir together. My dad was really quiet. My mom was more outgoing. Um, my mom was sweet. She's kind. Donna was funny. She was very outgoing. She was loving. She loved her family. My mom, growing up, she had one sister. They did everything together. My granddad and grandma, my mom and my aunt, they did a lot of church activities. Eventually, Kurt got up the nerve to ask Donna out. She said yes. From the first minute of that first date, Kurt knew Donna was the one. He decides he's going to marry Donna. He was the type of guy who wants to figure out something, he's just going to do it. Turns out Donna felt the same way. My mom and dad loved each other. I think they went on one date and then they were engaged. They were totally opposite in some parts of their life. And I think that religion was the one thing that had them together. I think that my mom wanted a family. My dad wanted a family. Engaged. 
engaged in 1980, Kurt and Donna married at the church where they met. And six months later, Donna learned she was pregnant with twin girls. Two daughters, twins, Amber and Anna Lisa. When we were born, she was working and then she quit and stayed home. My mom loved us. She'd do anything for us kids. Three years later, Donna gave birth to a third child, a boy named Austin. Austin was a little brother. He's a good kid. He's always laughing, always smiling. It seemed like a fairly nice Idaho family. While Donna stayed at home taking care of the children, Kurt supported the family by working at Hewlett Packard. Kurt was a very hard worker. He worked at HP for many, many years. He did a lot of travel with HP. With Kurt's job providing a solid financial footing, he and Donna found an even stronger foundation in their faith. We grew up Christian. Church was not an option. It was the way. My mom didn't drink. My mom and dad didn't smoke. There were no drugs, no alcohol, ever. Kurt didn't have any tolerance for substance abuse for people who used substances to any degree. Um, he was a very clean living person. There were rules set that that's not gonna happen in this house. We were taught to not cuss. We were taught to not be disrespectful. My mom was very like a helicopter mom. She always knew everything. Um, nothing was a secret. I mean, we didn't really do anything by ourselves. And when it came to her baby boy, Austin, Donna was particularly doting. Donna loved Austin. I mean, very, very much. He's really funny. He always made me laugh. But, um, pretty charismatic. Outgoing, for sure. Austin was a football player. We went to every football game. We did all his sports. My dad did not play sports at all, but my dad went to every single game. He made sure that he was involved in that. Austin and his mom, they had a pretty open relationship. He could just be himself around her. They talked about everything. As the kids grew older, Kurt and Donna looked for ways to give back to their community. Donna started an in-home daycare. My grandma actually had a daycare at her house, and then my mom had a daycare at her house. And then they would do, like, activities and stuff. Kurt developed a much-needed passion of his own. My dad met a guy at a church, and he was deaf, and they didn't have an interpreter. And my dad didn't think it was fair, so he learned to sign and became an interpreter for the church every Sunday. I don't believe anyone in Kurt's family was deaf. I think he just fell in love with the culture, the people, and it just made sense to him. There's something about American Sign Language and the deaf culture, the deaf community, that just feels like coming home to some people. And I think that's what it was for Kurt. I met Kurt through church. Kurt always liked to talk and hang out with us and the interpreters in the church environment. I depended on him and he depended on me. He was a good person. He was friendly to people. They seemed to be good to each other. They just seemed like they were a good family. But on a cold January afternoon in 2003, a tragic scene would tear the family apart. I respond to the residents, and I see Kurt Thorngren in the bathroom. It was a violent death. Make no mistake about that. After 22 years of marriage and raising three kids, the loving, God-fearing couple of Donna and Kurt Thorngren had entered a new phase of their life together. Donna had opened an in-home daycare, while Kurt spent his free time interpreting for the deaf. But on the afternoon of January 12th, 2003, the Thorngren's life together took a gruesome turn when their 21-year-old daughter, Amber, found her father, Kurt, dead in the family home. He was shot in the face right after he got home from church. As police begin to process the scene, this presumed suicide investigation quickly comes into question. Where's the gun? Didn't see a gun. And certainly investigatively, there's a big difference between a suicide and a homicide. And when investigators take a closer look at Kurt's body, another stunning discovery is made. And we learned that he was shot in the mouth 
in that he was shot twice on the top of the head. Kurt had been murdered. Investigators scour the home for clues as to how and why this happened. It's a single family home, probably 1,400 square feet, three bedroom, two bath. And Austin's bedroom was on past the bathroom. A window was open in Austin's bedroom. There was some property in there that was unplugged. Things like electronics were unplugged. They were um, set like they were going to be taken out of the house. They kind of moved around as if somebody was going to take them, but didn't take them. Like a burglary got interrupted. Amber tells us that the front door is ajar when she comes home, which is unusual for her. She says with that was there, it would normally be shut and locked. For detectives, an interrupted robbery seems like a plausible explanation. But at the same time, the nature of Kurt's death also feels personal. Most likely the first shot will give them the opportunity to flee. You know, I would be incapacitated. To then put two more shots on the top of my head uh, indicates that someone wanted me dead. While CSI processed the scene, investigators turned to Kurt's family. Amber had discovered her father's body as her mother Donna and twin sister Annalisa had just returned home, only to find the house swarming with police and EMTs. We were trying to figure out what happened. We were all scared. They said he was shot three times. The immediate family was very uh, upset. But no one seems more shaken up by Kurt's death than his wife of more than two decades. We told my mom that my dad was dead. And she was upset. I remember her being upset. Mom kept calling Austin. Austin pulled up and my mom ran to him and gave him a hug. And he had this look on his face like... He was in disbelief. Like, he looked like a ghost. I mean, genuinely distraught. You could tell that drastically affected by this. Then the police all asked us if we would go to the police station because they had some questions. And so we all went to the police station and they were just asking a bunch of questions. In speaking with uh, the family, Amber and Annalisa and Donna, they all described Kurt as being a person who was very set in his ways or patterned. Pressed by police for their thoughts on who might have done this to Kurt, Donna and her children draw a blank. He was a person who had no known enemies, so this was very unusual. While Kurt sounds like an improbable victim of a targeted killing, Donna and her daughters admit that over the past few months, their family has been plagued by one recurring problem. Talking with Donna and the girls, they were talking about some prior issues that they had at the home in regards to burglaries. The house kept getting robbed. We were all scared. We thought they were, people were going to get after us. As a result, they say, Kurt had become obsessed with protecting his family. He would talk to family friends and, and how he was concerned with the safety of his family because everything had been going on. He did sit in his room, his bathroom on, and the shotgun up at night because he was going to protect us. Investigators ask Donna and the twins if they have any idea who might be responsible for the burglaries. One woman in particular comes to mind. Jana Gomez, her name was brought to us by the family, ran a house, if you will, where teenage kids could come and either run away to or just find shelter and do what they want. There was no rules there. The kids that she allowed to stay there were not the good kids. They were robbing places, they were doing burglaries, they were assaulting people. The boys would give her the money, give her everything they had, and she would supply the drugs to them and alcohol. She would give them whatever they wanted. According to Donna, her 17-year-old son Austin went to school with some of the young men who stayed at Jana's house. And those kids knew exactly when Austin and the rest of the Thorngren family would be out of the house. We did church Wednesday nights, Sunday. I know that the house was robbed many times, usually on Sundays. Had one of the young lawbreakers broken into the Thorngren's home only to come across Kurt?
they wanted us to check that name out as far as a potential suspect. We definitely tried to figure out who this Jonna Gomez was and where we could find her. You have to take that seriously. You have to look at everything. That afternoon, police put out an APB on Jonna Gomez. But investigators can't locate Jonna in Meridian. It was a lot of hard work to try to find her. After an extensive search, when investigators finally do track her down, they discover she isn't even in Idaho. She was actually incarcerated in Salt Lake City when we interviewed her. Have you heard any bad news? Violent crimes that may have happened up in the I haven't talked to nobody down there. The death of a gentleman by the name of Curtis Barnard. encouraged anyone to commit crimes of any nature. No, I haven't heard. I heard that point. I was like, you know, I didn't know Mr. Stoneman. I never met him. However, Jonna tells police she does know 17-year-old Austin. They were friends. Austin would go there and hang out with her and crash there. I met Austin. He came to me right before Thanksgiving, I believe, and said his parents had thrown him out. I took him in. And then he was with me for probably a week or two. But what was Austin Thorngren, a well-behaved student athlete from a good home, doing hanging around Jana and her household of alleged juvenile delinquents? Austin had a lot of acres found out on the right camp and they gave him everything in the world. Police in Meridian, Idaho, are investigating the death of 42-year-old computer engineer Kurt Thorngren who, alongside his beloved wife Donna, raised three children in a tight-knit Christian family. Kurt was very religious. The daughters talked about the fact that he rarely, if ever, cussed. Um, always went to church. He was a hard-working man. For someone to be murdered in their bathroom, <laughs> to be minding their own business, who had done nothing wrong, just doesn't make sense to me. After speaking to Donna and her two daughters, Police have zeroed in on a woman named Jonna Gomez as a person of interest in Kurt's murder. Jonna is a lady who is my mom's age. She would just have these boys do robberies for her, and they would bring all the stuff back to her. Jonna tells police that she had nothing to do with Kurt Thorngren's murder, but admits she does have a unique relationship with Kurt's son, Austin. Um, I took Austin in. Under my wings, and I try to keep him straight as can be. According to Jonna, Austin was no longer the all-American kid Donna and Kurt had worked so hard to raise. Austin is a very lost hope. He used anything and everything. Okay, let's let's see if we can make this pot. For sure. Oh, he can't do it without pot. doing drugs and then Austin started running away. He started hanging out with the wrong people. He quit football. He quit school. When he was getting older with the drugs, my dad didn't agree with the drugs and Austin became very disrespectful. According to Jonna, Austin was not the target of robberies. Quite the contrary, in fact. He was basically just a drug addict committing burglaries, pawning the proceeds. And he was committing these burglaries with some delinquent friends. They were ripping each other off. They were ripping each other's dope off and they were all selling or, you know, this and that or they were ripping each other and sending each other off, you know, right and left. For investigators, Jonas claim raises an instant red flag. If you have someone dead in their home and you have a son living a life that could invite danger to the home, your suspect pool could be very large. And that could start you down a path of a very long investigation. Was this a drug case? Was this a drug deal combat? Or was this some kind of revenge over drugs? Maybe this was retaliation against his son. We assumed that somebody had come in to the house to get Austin. And that, that my dad was there. And Austin wasn't. People are killed and injured for drugs all the time. 
you know, methamphetamines, it's pretty unpredictable how people respond. Anger and rage seems to come often with that. Somebody under the influence doing something normally wouldn't do. Considering the source of these allegations, detectives aren't sure what to believe. They hope tracking down Austin Thorngren will be the key to cracking the case. From the interviews with the family, we knew that he had been at Grandma's. My brother was going to go to my grandma's house. That's where my brother stayed most of the time anyways. On January 15th, Austin Thorngren and his grandmother Alice arrive at the Meridian Police Station for an interview. You're free to leave, and this is just, you know, a voluntary statement that we would like to have gotten from, from him that night, Sunday uh, afternoon. And uh, we're just going to afford uh, Austin the same treatment that we did the other folks that night. Just, uh, you know, slipped away from us, for, for lack of a better term. He's extremely nervous and fidgety to be there. He doesn't like being in the police department. I haven't had a good relationship with him all the time. He did ask questions about drugs all the time. I tell him, I just didn't talk to him about drugs. So then we were talking about. <coughs> and, uh, it was, when was the last time things were good with your dad? Anytime there's drugs injected into an investigation, you have to take that seriously. You have to look at everything. Knowing that Austin had been involved with some violent characters at Jana's, and that his drug problem had caused a rift in the family, investigators press Austin for more details about his relationship with Kurt. Will anyone tell us that 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 you even jokingly or something said that you'd like to, you know, see your dad dead, or that that you'd like to kill him or anything like that? I know I've said I hate him. After a while, 
Donna goes away. Adam goes back there. He said that, you know, Austin looks like he's in shock. He's shaky. And he asks him, you know, what's wrong? Austin, his wife, he, he looks scared. And he says to Adam, I think my mom just told me that. I remember thinking, Donna Thorngren? I was quite shocked by that. Investigators are working to confirm Adam's story, but if his version of events is the truth, what does this mean for the Thorngren family? It really put us kind of in a tailspin to try to figure out, now what do we have? A friend is telling us that according to Austin, he's been told by his mom that she just killed his dad. This is at least two to three hours before Kurt's body is discovered by Amber, the other daughter. It would have been after he had been murdered, but before the body was discovered. After all, like Jonna, Adam Ketterling isn't exactly the most reliable source. Adam Ketterling had, you know, admittedly been using drugs all night. i uh, had been up all night. In an effort to uncover the truth, investigators need to reach out to Donna Thorngren to set up an interview. But before that happens, Donna's daughter Amber delivers another tragic bit of information. Amber calls me and indicates that her mom has potentially overdosed on pills and they're taking her to the hospital. She had taken nine Ambien and implied that she was trying to take her life. With a loving marriage, a trio of adoring children, and a devout faith in God, Kurt and Donna Thorngren truly seem to be living a blessed life. But in wake of Kurt's gruesome murder, investigators have a strong suspicion that Donna had something to do with the crime. A friend is telling us that according to Austin, he's been told by his mom that she just killed his dad. But before they can track down Donna for questioning, a call from her daughter adds a disturbing twist to the case. Amber indicates that her mom has potentially overdosed on pills and they're taking her to the hospital. She implied that she was trying to take her life. Was Donna's attempted suicide a reaction to losing the love of her life in such sudden horrific fashion? Or was she trying to avoid answering questions about potentially killing her own husband? Unfortunately for investigators, it's a conversation that will have to wait. She was in a protected setting for a couple days where she didn't have to answer questions. While Donna recovers from her failed suicide attempt, police take a deeper look into her marriage to Kurt. My dad and mom argued about Austin a lot. Austin was suffering from a severe meth addiction at the time. It was very uh, heartbreaking. They didn't agree on how to deal with Austin's problems. Kurt's idea was tough love. I'm not gonna enable him. Kurt made no secret to the fact that Austin would be moving out when he turned 18. It wasn't just about moving out, it was about the things I was doing at the house that shouldn't have been allowed, that she would allow. Because Austin would be cooking his meth on the stove. Donna was more protective. Uh, let's keep an eye on him, let's do whatever we need to do to keep him under our wing so harm doesn't come to him. It was hell for my dad. I think that at some point, my dad lost control of Austin. My mom hid a lot of the stuff that was happening. So by the time my dad found out, Austin was already too far in. As for Kurt's threat to remove Austin from their home when he turned 18, friends say Donna had no intention of ever letting that happen. Which makes the timing of her husband's death all the more suspicious. Kurt was killed two days before Austin was a term 18. You know, you gotta wonder, is that alone enough to kill your husband? I don't know. People have been killed for less. Finally, on January 19th, Donna Thorngren is released from the hospital. Police waste no time bringing her in for questioning. She was out within, a, I think, a few days. For a woman who is suspected of murdering her husband, and who almost died days earlier, Donna seems surprisingly composed. Donna comes in, I mean, with Detective Miller and I, and she's very engaged, very cooperative. Investigators start by going back through Donna's activities on the day of the murder. Yeah, that's my little one. 
Once my dad's receipt, I'll so be free at 7.30 and when I got up, I did know about the housework and I started painting. She remodeled her bathroom, fresh coat of paint, and so she was working on that project first thing in the morning. And she had some errands to run. She went to like, the Texaco and then she goes and gets lunch for Kurt. Yeah, so I would say 10.30 because I went through Taco Time and then went to Taco Bell. Okay. I think we talked about that. You said. Yeah, because I gave you that receipt. She produces all these receipts. She has a handwritten timeline, I mean, to the minute. It was 9.47, or it was roundabout numbers. It was very specific. So you start being suspicious of all of those things. She never once cried. Your husband's been murdered, and you're talking about his last moments on Earth. You would kind of get a little weepy, I would imagine. Nothing. It was all, like, very matter-of-fact. Towards the end of the interview, we start getting in more into the personal side, the relationship between her and Kurt, and to talk about that and talk about those things that we hear from people. At that point, the interview starts to change a little bit, and you can tell she becomes a lot more uneasy in answering those questions. Describe the relationship between Kurt, you and Kurt, the last, well, up until, until his death, were you guys getting along? We fought like normal people. So did you have like seven rooms? I slept on the couch and I had done that. We had three big dogs. And the dogs would sleep in the front room with my mom. And then my dad would sleep in his room. The marriage had been dysfunctional for a very long time. It came down to power and then it came out of control. I don't think she felt she had any more control over her life. And that lack of control only intensified when it came to the family finances. There was a period that it was really rough. And that's when we got the separate accounts. Can you tell, tell us about that? Um, because I had a lot of debt. I charge a lot. Because I buy things for my kids. And so that way, his was separate. So I had to pay for my own charges. They did not agree on money. Donna had a massive spending problem. My mom had an issue with money. And I don't know what the money was spent on. I know she... She would buy us clothes. I know she spent a lot on us. And going out, Kurt found out that she had racked up about $50,000 in credit card debt. And this debt was incurred secretly. In 2002, Kurt completely takes financial control over. Donna no longer has access to their bank account. As detectives' questions become more pointed, Donna makes a startling admission. What's the worst thing people are going to say? That they've heard you say about Kurt? Oh, probably he's worth more than my life. What is he worth it? 50000 That's it? Yeah. He has the basic life insurance. He just added a policy for accidental death. She's like 50000 And a true payout was more around 320000 In the fall before the murder, Months before the murder, she and Kurt jointly decided to increase it to, I believe, 240000 Then there's a scratch out on that worksheet and her handwriting writing at $320,000. If you're looking at $320,000, that's significant. That alone is motive. However, Donna steadfastly denies any involvement in Kurt's murder. I didn't do it. And Austin didn't do it. And if you guys want to try to try me, because I didn't do it. Are you... Are you arrested? Are you arrested? No, it's very well. And then the interview is over, obviously, at that point. And we let her walk free. She, she walks out that day. There was enough doubt with all of these little tidbits that you just couldn't shut the door on it. Nothing was the, the smoking gun, if you will. Over the next few years, detectives examine and re-examine the case files, but aren't able to glean any additional evidence that might link Donna to the crime. That is, until detectives decide to re-examine the evidence taken from the crime scene. Donna had told police that she was painting in the bathroom and that she was wearing these pants and that she had taken off these pants and left them in the bathroom. They were in a pile, like if you were standing up and you dropped your pants and stepped out of them, they're closing up getting processed for GSR, a gunshot residue. 
one thing you've got to realize about GSR is it's like powder goes everywhere. In a tiny enclosed space like this teeny tiny little bathroom, that's why it should have had GSR everywhere on those pants, and they didn't. If those clothes were like that when Kurt was killed in that bathroom, the GSR would have been on top. And as we stretch those clothes out, that's not the case. The, the gunshot residue distributed along the clothing and predominantly on the right side of the clothing. The way the gunshot residue was distributed evenly along the pants means Donna must have been wearing them when Kurt was shot. It was a huge break for us. When she told police that she had been wearing those pants and then left them in there and has no idea what happened, she's lying. Because... Those pants were not in the bathroom when Kurt was murdered. Why would you lie about that unless you have something to hide? I believe she shot him in the mouth. Finally, in June 2006, more than three years after Kurt Thorngren's murder, authorities are ready to make their move. We did a, a grand jury indictment and a warrant for her arrest, and she ultimately turned herself into the sheriff's office. When Kurt and Donna's twin daughters get wind of their mother's arrest, they're floored. I was 100% sure that she did not do it. I would have given my life for that. I would have said in a heartbeat that she would have told me. I would have known. It tore the whole family apart. The twins, they loved their mom so much. And there were so many people that believe in her innocence. But investigators aren't done filing charges against members of the Thorngren family. The same day, they charge Austin as an accessory to murder after the fact. His involvement was most likely failing to be totally honest with us about who killed his dad. We believe that at the end of the day, on January 12th, he knew exactly what happened. For months, detectives in Idaho have been building a case against Donna Thorngren, who they believe murdered her husband, Kurt, in an effort to protect her son Austin from being kicked out of the house and cash in on a potentially massive life insurance policy in the process. It took us a very long time to put the whole thing together. We got stacks of tapes of interviews and the GSR. You start putting all those puzzle pieces together into a workable document that would stand up in court. On July 23, 2007, in Ada County Court, Donna Thorngren's trial begins. Her twin daughters, Amber and Annalisa, greet the proceedings with mixed emotions. We just want the truth. That's what all we said the whole time. That's all we want. We can't change anything, but tell us the truth. Prosecutors open their case by laying out what they believe happened that fateful day in 2003. When Kurt came home from church, Donna was hiding somewhere in the house, possibly the, the computer room across from the bathroom. I think she already had the weapon. She already prepared for what she was going to do. She knew Kurt's behavior. She knew when he would be there. There was possibly a confrontation right there in the door of the bathroom. She shot him in the mouth. He went down. She stood over him. She took closer aim and put two more on the top of his head to make sure he was dead. When it's their turn, the defense largely hinges their case on a single yet important point. It was a completely circumstantial case. They were unable to find the same gun that they believed had been used in the murder. It's a point prosecutors can do little to rebut. And as both sides rest, there's one thing on which they can agree. The case against Donna Thorngren is far from open and shut. Interestingly enough, the jury deliberated for over three days. I just remember my mom sitting there. She didn't look at us. She didn't cry. She just sat stone-faced. At the end of the day, they came back with guilty. Her sentence was life in prison with the first 20 years fixed. In 20 years, she gets to appear before the parole commission. As the years have passed, even Donna Thorngren's staunchest supporters have begun to question her story. In fact, maybe they were wrong about this devoted housewife and mother of three all along. 
My mom is lying about what happened. She had something to do with it. I don't know what exactly she did. I don't know if she pulled the trigger, but she was there. You didn't stop it, and you set it up. So, that's on you. All you have to do is tell the truth. She won't. That's what hurts, is that she didn't give us an option. We don't have family. It ruined everything. It ruined our lives. It ruins everything. Willoughby Hills, Ohio, November 16th, 2012. It was a typically quiet night in this pleasant little town of 9,000, just 20 minutes east of Cleveland. It was a really nice place. It's through rolling hills, lots of trees, really peaceful. You don't ever really hear of anything bad going on out there. But then, just a little after 1 o'clock that Friday morning, 911, what is an emergency? <laughs> Desperate to determine what was going on, the dispatcher tried to get the caller to calm down. You need to take a deep breath for me so I can understand you. And then the dispatcher tried again. Who had the knife? <laughs> You could hear on the 911 call where she's screaming. I've been doing this about 20 years. It is by far the worst 911 call I have heard. The dispatcher immediately routed all available units to the scene. I got everyone coming down. And when the first patrol car pulled up outside the nondescript suburban home, a terrified 13-year-old girl ran out the front door, still clutching the phone she just used to dial 911. She's saying, you know, she's stabbing my mother. There's blood all over. The first officer at the scene rushed past the frightened teenager, hurrying inside with his gun drawn. The officers did not know what they were getting into when they came on the scene. Uh, all they knew was something very terrible was happening. And as the officer approached the home's master bedroom, he voiced the command to come out uh, more than once with their hands up. Finally, after several tense seconds, someone emerged. 18-year-old Sabrina Zunig. She is covered in blood from head to toe. And the obviously distraught teenager still had a bloody knife in her hand. She's probably lucky that the officer didn't kill her right there. Thankfully... When the officer ordered Sabrina to drop the knife, the terrified teen complied. Sabrina did not offer any resistance. But the shocking scene did present the police with a mystery. What could possibly compel a young girl to commit such a brutal crime? I knew in my gut there was more to the story, and more was going to come out. Born in 1994, Sabrina spent her early childhood in the Cleveland suburbs in a situation no child should have to endure. Her father was a paranoid schizophrenic who had just numerous run-ins with the law, drug problems. Her mother had drug problems, multiple drug arrests. The result was an early intervention by the Child Protective Services. Custody was taken from her mother and uh, the county was involved with her from the time she was a very young child. Sabrina was placed with her grandmother, but within a few years, it was apparent that lasting damage had already been done. She just had an extremely unstable upbringing. She got in a lot of fights. She was in trouble often. She got bad grades. She just didn't do well, didn't fit in. And by the time she was a teenager, her grandmother decided that Sabrina was more than she could handle. Her grandmother couldn't control her at all. She was elderly, and, and that's how she ended up in foster care. In June of 2010, the 15-year-old was sent to live in what became the first in a series of group homes and foster placements. She bounced around from one home to another home, from one foster family to another foster family, uh, never being able to make it work. And considering why it never worked, it appeared that Sabrina was well on her way to ending up like her parents. It was always Sabrina acting out or committing a theft or getting involved in drugs. The cards were stacked against her. 
But then, in July of 2011, social services placed Sabrina with a new foster family, the Knafels. In their early 40s, when they took Sabrina in, Lisa and Kevin Knafel appeared to be everything her birth parents weren't. Lisa and Kevin Knafel appeared to have it all. They had a beautiful house um, in Willoughby Hills. They had uh, lovely children. Lisa had a teenage daughter from a prior marriage, and together they had a, uh, a little girl. Kevin drove a truck for a food service company, and Lisa had made a career out of helping troubled kids. Lisa Knafel was a social worker for Cuyahoga County. Lisa's job was to uh, provide ongoing services for children who are in counseling and treatment. She was really good with, with kids put in bad situations. In other words, Lisa appeared to be exactly the sort of foster mother Sabrina needed. Lisa loved children, and she loved to help people. Lisa was a very caring individual. She, she always put others before herself. In fact, Lisa and Kevin had already successfully fostered several children. When she had foster children, she treated them like they were her own. She made sure she went the extra mile to, to be a good parent. However, Sabrina's case would be the first time the couple had taken in a teenager. Lisa generally had foster children the age of like three to seven. Sabrina was 17 at the time and they thought this, this would be easy. By all accounts, Sabrina shared their optimism. She felt that with the Knafels, her life would be different. She's living in a bad environment her entire life up to that point. You know, then when she finally moves in with Lisa and Kevin, she's in a great home, loving family. From the start, Sabrina got along well with Kevin and Lisa's daughters. Sabrina thought of them as sisters. And Lisa treated Sabrina no different from her foster sisters. Lisa was kind of strict. She wanted her to be a lady. You know, she wanted her to, you know, get good grades in school and graduate. Kevin, meanwhile, was more laid back when it came to parenting. Kevin was kind of lenient, was like kind of Sabrina's best friend. And after a few months of living with the Knafels, it appeared that their approach was working. She was starting to get her life together and try to get on the right track. Supported by her new foster parents, the formerly troubled teen took to her new high school. Her grades improved and she was just doing great. She fits in fine. She gets in no problems. She doesn't skip school. She was even making friends. We had two classes together. And by the time she finished her junior year, almost no trace remained of the formerly withdrawn and troubled team. Sabrina was outgoing and very friendly and just kind of cocky. Nobody can really hold me back type of attitude. And it appeared to be true. She wanted to be a massage therapist. And by the time she started her senior year of high school in fall of 2012, after more than a year with the Knafels, it appeared that Sabrina finally had the two things that had eluded her for her entire life. A family and a future. Being placed with the Knafels was a dream come true for her. In fact, when she turned 18 at the end of October, old enough to opt out of foster care, she applied to the state for permission to stay with the Knafels. She wanted to remain in foster care. But just three weeks later, Sabrina's dream would end in a nightmare. <laughs> and when the police responded to the frantic 911 call, they would find the teen fleeing her foster mother's bedroom, bloody knife in hand. Coming up, the EMT's fight to save Lisa. She sustained... 178 stab and slashing wounds. And the investigators uncover a possible motive. They call the relationship kind of creepy. At 1.15 a.m. on November 16, 2012, police received a frantic 911 call from a 13-year-old girl in the Cleveland suburb of Willoughby Hills. You hear a screaming young child saying her mother's being murdered. And according to the girl on the phone, the killer was her foster sister, 
18-year-old Sabrina Sunik. She stabbed your mom? <laughs> Police were on the scene within minutes. They find Sabrina bloodied, holding a knife. They placed her under arrest after they secured the scene. And then, in the home's master bedroom. The officer finds a complete bloodbath. It was a slaughterhouse. Lying on the floor in the midst of the bloody scene was Sabrina's foster mother, 41-year-old Lisa Knafel. They tried to do uh, CPR. But it was no use. She was just gone. In the closet of the master bedroom, the police made another shocking discovery. Lisa and Kevin's three-year-old daughter. The little girl was unharmed, at least physically. I don't even want to know how much she hurt. It appeared that the vicious attack on Lisa had been so frenzied that Sabrina had inadvertently slashed herself with the knife as her foster mother fought back. She had wounds all over her that required stitches. She was placed in an ambulance given some medical treatment. While Sabrina was transported to the hospital, the investigators turned to Lisa's 13-year-old daughter, who'd made the 911 call. Lisa Knafel's oldest teen daughter entered the room while her mother was struggling with Sabrina. Questioned at the scene, the teenager told the investigators that her stepfather, Kevin Knafel, was away, working. Kevin was a truck driver, and he was on the road. He worked third shift. Lisa's daughter said she'd been asleep in her room. When suddenly... She's spoken from the screams uh, of, of Lisa and Sabrina. And when she rushed into the master bedroom... What she's saying is the very gruesome, graphic murder of her own mother. According to Lisa's daughter, she'd screamed for Sabrina to stop. She is begging Sabrina to spare her mother's life. But Sabrina hadn't stopped. She's just repeatedly stabbing her, one stab after another stab. So Lisa's daughter had run for the phone and dialed 911. You can hear on the 911 call where she's screaming at Sabrina. The 911 call wasn't all that backed up the girl's harrowing account. There was also the bloody knife that Sabrina had drawn. It was so violent that the knife was bent. The bloody bedroom bore more evidence of the brutal assault. It appeared that Lisa fought for her life. There were things knocked over. There was blood everywhere. And finally, there was Lisa's body. She ultimately sustained 178 stab and slashing wounds. I'm sure a very painful way for her to die. It was not quick. And much like the bedroom, Lisa's body gave mute testimony to the vicious struggle that preceded her death. There were def serious defensive wounds. One finger was almost cut off. However, there was one question that neither Lisa's body nor her daughter could answer. Why? For that, they turned to the 18-year-old killer. There was little doubt that Sabrina had stabbed her foster mother to death. They find Sabrina bloodied, holding a knife. However, when the investigators questioned Sabrina after her injuries had been stitched up. She didn't remember what had happened. She said, I remember going into Lisa's room to get some medicine uh, because I had a headache. That's the last thing I remember. With Sabrina unable, or at least unwilling, to talk, the investigators did the only thing they could, considering the circumstances. They put her in jail and then just kind of left her there. Meanwhile, Sabrina's foster father, Kevin, rushed home to the scene of his wife's murder. But once he arrived, the truck driver appeared more curious than grief-stricken. He wanted to see the bedroom for himself after she was killed. The police thought that was strange. And the police weren't the only ones who thought Kevin's behavior was a bit off, either. The next day, when family and friends gathered at his mother's house, other people noticed, too. His demeanor was so... I don't know. I can't 
see how a person should appear when their wife's been brutally murdered, but he just didn't appear to be phased by it. He was greeting people and shaking their hand. There was not really that emotion that you would see from someone that just lost their, their wife tragically. And then, a few days later, at Lisa's funeral, we thought it odd that Kevin would ask everyone to pray for Sabrina. Considering that Sabrina had just killed his wife, Kevin's behavior was certainly strange. And in light of what the investigators learned once they started interviewing Lisa and Sabrina's friends and family, it started looking a little suspicious, too. According to her friends, Lisa had initially been extremely happy about her new foster daughter. She had only positive things to say about Sabrina. She was getting great grades in school and the therapy was working really well and she was such a sweetheart. However, their sweetheart relationship hadn't lasted. She did say that Sabrina was undermining her relationship with Kevin. Everyone the investigators spoke to agreed that Sabrina had always gotten along better with Kevin than she did with Lisa. Kevin was kind of lenient, whereas Lisa was kind of strict in terms of in terms of rules. Sabrina would always tell me that whenever she needed something, she would just go to Kevin for it. And as a result, friends said that Sabrina and Kevin had grown close, uncomfortably close. They called the relationship kind of creepy. They were too friendly. They were too close. And not in a way that was at all appropriate for a father and his teenage daughter. They would make sexual jokes towards each other. And if they did more than joke? It was not only inappropriate, but it was illegal. Even though Sabrina Zunik was 18 at the time, because she was in foster care still, it was statutory rape. If Sabrina and Kevin were having an affair, that is, something her friends certainly suspected. I believe... Sabrina was attracted to Kevin because she had daddy issues and a lot of abandonment issues. However, while the investigators definitely needed to look into the possible affair between Sabrina and Kevin, there was nothing to indicate the truck driver had been involved in his wife's murder. He was gone that night. He was on the road. And there was plenty of evidence of friction between Lisa and her foster daughter. By all accounts, Sabrina was really upset with Lisa over the house rules. Sabrina told me over Facebook that her foster mother was always mean to her and she hated her. They fought constantly. On a couple of occasions, the fights had been loud enough that a neighbor had called the police. Because of some screaming matches between her and Sabrina. And shortly before the murder, according to what her ex-husband told the investigators, Lisa had reached her limit. A week before the murder, Lisa did um, call me and um, express she wanted her out of the house. She was told flat out that, she, you know, as of January 1, you're no longer welcome here. A history of fights with her foster mother. The possibility that the teenager viewed Lisa as some sort of romantic rival. And the threat of losing her home. To the investigators, it all appeared to add up to one thing. It just appeared that an unstable foster child snapped. She would always say, you know, her and Lisa were having an argument or she was grounded because of Lisa. But there were also questions about the 18-year-old's relationship with her foster father, Kevin Knafel. The vibe that I got from Kevin and Sabrina's relationship was that they were more of a boyfriend and girlfriend than they were father and daughter. However, despite the rumors of a relationship with his foster daughter, there was no evidence that Kevin had anything to do with his wife's murder. In fact, the 42-year-old truck driver wasn't even in town when the stabbing occurred. They could verify that by the GPS in the truck. And by then, the investigators had also uncovered evidence that Sabrina had been plotting to kill her foster mother for some time. It all started when one of Sabrina's high school classmates came forward. I went to the police because I felt like it was the right thing to do. He told them he'd seen information about the murder on Facebook 
specifically a post Sabrina's friend Autumn Pavlik made after hearing about the murder. A commented saying, you know, I can't believe she did it. And what's more, based on the context of her comments. Autumn knew it was going to happen. She just didn't believe that Sabrina was going to go through with it. And when the investigators got in touch with Autumn, she not only confirmed what Sabrina's classmates suspected, that she knew Sabrina had been planning to kill Lisa. She told them how she knew. Sabrina wanted me to help her take Lisa out of the picture. According to Autumn, Sabrina had come to her a few months before the murder with a bizarre request. She wanted to know if I knew any hitmen. But what really intrigued the investigators was why Sabrina supposedly wanted a hitman. Sabrina told me that Lisa and Kevin were getting a divorce. Was it possible Sabrina and her foster father really were having an affair? The police started second-guessing his possible involvement. However, every time the investigators approached Sabrina with questions about her alleged affair with Kevin and the possibility that he might be involved in Lisa's murder, she refused to cooperate. For months and months, she kind of kept her mouth shut. But then, in May of 2013, six months after the murder... All of a sudden, she says, I want to talk to the detective. Her sudden reversal was easy to understand. Her attorney starts telling her, you could possibly be looking at the death penalty. You're certainly looking at 30 years to life, probably without the possibility of parole. But whatever her motivation for coming forward, once Sabrina sat down with the homicide detectives and the Lake County prosecutor, she started out by ending months of speculation about her and Kevin. Sabrina said it was a love affair. According to what Sabrina told the investigators, the first time they'd had sex, it was April of 2012. At the time, she was 17. By then, she'd been with the family almost nine months, long enough for Kevin to become a trusted confidant. They were very close, kind of like friends and not like father and daughter. And when Sabrina confided that she was considering a career as a massage therapist, he asked for a massage. And she was giving him a, a massage, and then it kind of turned into more than a massage. However, the teen insisted that Kevin hadn't taken advantage of her. Sabrina said it was very much consensual. Not that it mattered much to the authorities. The arrangement was very predatory in terms of her age and her status in the home. Nevertheless, Sabrina told the investigators that she and Kevin were planning to spend the rest of their lives together. She was in love with him. They're going to live happily ever after. Not only that, according to Sabrina, the plan was for them to raise Kevin and Lisa's three-year-old daughter, too. That's what she wanted. She wanted them to all be together without Lisa. And Sabrina claimed that Kevin had wanted that, too. Sabrina says that um, Kevin and her had plotted this whole thing out. According to Sabrina... The plan had been to kill Lisa in her sleep and then make it look as if someone had broken into the house. The plot was to make it look like a burglary. Sabrina also claimed that they had decided that the murder should occur while Kevin was on the road, giving him an ironclad alibi. That was a, a normal pattern for them, that he wasn't home in the evenings. So according to Sabrina, at around 1 o'clock in the morning on November 16, 2012, while Kevin was safely gone on his truck driving job, she had crept into Lisa's bedroom with a knife. However, Sabrina said that when she plunged the knife into her foster mother, the plan to strike a killing blow had immediately gone awry. The first place she had stabbed her was in her face. And as a result, Lisa woke up screaming. And she started fighting for her life. Lisa's screams woke her daughters. Lisa's oldest daughter called 911. And with the police on their way and Lisa's daughter as a witness, there had been no chance to make the murder look like a burglary gone bad. But according to Sabrina, Kevin had already thought of that possibility and come up with a contingency plan. Kevin told Sabrina to tell the authorities that she had no clue. What happened? She didn't remember what happened. She blacked out. Sabrina would be declared mentally ill and 
serve some time in a mental health facility and, and get out, do no hard time. That's what he told her. Sabrina believed that they would be together. Now, the question was whether or not the authorities believed Sabrina. Prosecutors were expecting some self-serving statement for her to get herself out of trouble. What they needed was some way to corroborate what she had told them. And in July of 2013, the investigators came up with a plan. The police asked me to make controlled phone calls to Kevin Knievel. While the investigators listened in, Sabrina's friend Autumn made two separate phone calls to Kevin. But the results were disappointing. I had small talk with Kevin. I mean, there wasn't really much to it. So the investigators decided to up the ante. Autumn did agree to wear a wire and goes to Kevin's house. It was my job to prove his involvement. But would the results be worth the risk? He really doesn't admit anything on tape. However, when the teen accused him of having an affair with Sabrina and pushing her to commit murder, he did not deny anything. He just kind of went along with it. And that was enough for the investigators. On August 9th, 2013, the Willoughby Hills Police arrested Kevin Knafel on murder charges. It goes from just a mentally ill girl killing her foster mother to something way larger than that. The arrest of Sabrina's foster father may have stunned the greater community, but Lisa's friends had a far different reaction, considering what many of them had long suspected about Kevin's relationship with his foster daughter. When I heard that Kevin was arrested, I thought to myself, I knew it. I, I knew that he had something to do with this. However, at the time of his arrest, Kevin insisted the alleged affair never happened. There's no evidence that uh, Kevin had ever done anything inappropriate with Sabrina. And as for being involved in his wife's murder, there was no real physical evidence against Kevin Knafel. No DNA, no videotapes, there's nothing. What the prosecutor did have, however, was Sabrina. The whole thing kind of hinged on Sabrina Zunick and whether a jury would believe her statement. In fact, according to the prosecution, the entire plot had been Kevin's idea. Kevin pretty much played her. First, according to the prosecution, he had ruthlessly taken advantage of the troubled teenager's feelings for him. The defendant in this case unlawfully engaged in sexual conduct with Sabrina Zunick. She was just easily manipulated. And after years in foster care, the prosecution claimed she was especially vulnerable to someone like Kevin. Sabrina wanted a father figure. Then, once Kevin had seduced the troubled teenager, the prosecutor claimed that Sabrina's foster father and lover had manipulated her into committing murder. He told her they could finally be together if Lisa was gone. The plan that was eventually settled on was to stay on Lisa's death. For Sabrina to stay on Lisa's death. He strategically made it happen while he wasn't home so he could not be implicated. Kevin was just going to let her take the fall for it. That was Kevin's plan. At first, everything appeared to work. Lisa had been brutally murdered. Lisa fought and fought and fought for her life. And the authorities had initially suspected that Sabrina had acted alone. The foster child had been angry at Lisa, attacked her in the middle of the night. Unfortunately, Kevin wasn't home and she had been killed. But then Sabrina had betrayed her lover, revealing the full extent of Kevin's murder plot. He hated, solicited and when the case went to trial, Sabrina was prepared to take the stand and face her former lover as the prosecution's star witness. She agrees to testify against Kevin in exchange for the prosecutor's deal of life with parole eligibility in 30 years. However, according to the defense, there was one major problem with the prosecution's case. 
the only evidence they had was Sabrina. And according to what Kevin's attorney said in his opening statement, there was a very good reason for that. The state's entire case is fiction. It was completely Sabrina's story. This whole fairy tale fantasy. A fantasy that early on the morning of November 16th, 2012, had turned Kevin and Lisa's lives into a nightmare. And according to the defense, she had done it because she had convinced herself that Kevin wanted her to do it. In her mind, she and Kevin were going to run off with the little girl and they were going to create their own nuclear family. And according to the defense, while Sabrina's confession was the sole evidence implicating Kevin, there was plenty to back up their contention that the troubled teen had an extremely shaky grasp on reality. The evidence will reflect that Sabrina Zilli received mental health care from the time of approximately six years old. She did have um, psychiatric problems. And she had been diagnosed as bipolar. She was a very, very troubled individual. Much of the defense strategy was trying to undermine Sabrina's credibility by playing off her documented history of mental illness. However, when the prosecution started presenting its case, they claimed that Kevin also had a powerful and far more rational motive for wanting his wife dead. Kevin benefited from Lisa's death with three or four life insurance policies um, that totaled up to about $780,000. And according to one of the prosecution's first witnesses, a benefits coordinator from the insurance company, Kevin had been awfully anxious to collect. Within nine hours of Lisa's death, he is on the phone asking about benefits. On cross-examination, the defense did its best to contain the damage. The funeral had to get paid for, and everyone admitted that after a person's deceased, it's normal to contact the insurance companies. And they had even better luck when Sabrina's friend Autumn took the stand and testified about how Sabrina had asked her about hiring hitmen. On cross-examination, she was forced to acknowledge that Kevin had never been part of any of those conversations. Autumn also made a surprising admission about the alleged affair between Sabrina and Kevin. Sabrina never told me they were... Whatsoever that Kevin had any type of sexual relationship with her. All the prosecutors had was Sabrina's account of the affair. But they did claim that Kevin and Sabrina's cell phone records suggested there was something going on between the teenager and her foster father. In one month, Sabrina and Kevin had texted, called over 2,000 times. In fact, Kevin had called and texted with Sabrina far more than he did with his wife. Kevin and Lisa only talked to each other maybe 200. And the pattern held right up to the moment of Lisa's murder. The night before Lisa was killed, Sabrina and Kevin had been texting a lot. They had been in constant contact through the whole night. However, while the prosecution made a big deal about the almost 70 text messages exchanged by Kevin and Sabrina in the six hours before Lisa's death, the defense was quick to point out one thing. The content of the text messages is unknown, and the FBI were unable to retrieve any of the text messages off of Sabrina's phone. The prosecution did have one witness privy to what was in those texts, though. A witness who said she knew all the salacious details about the couple's taboo relationship. On June 5th, Sabrina took the stand as the prosecution's star witness. The state was hanging its hat on Sabrina. The 19-year-old began her testimony by insisting that she and Kevin had been having a sexual relationship, one that she documented in graphic detail. From that fateful first massage... I just massaged it in our thighs and it progressively got more up into the genitals. To how they hooked up every morning before Kevin drove her to school. We get into the car and I was doing job. I was appalled and I still am. He was working in the capacity of a foster parent. You know, that makes it even more um, unacceptable. And once Kevin had seduced her, 
Sabrina claimed that he had started filling her full of ideas about the bright future they could have if Lisa was dead. He told her she was worth more dead than alive, and they could finally be together if Lisa was gone. The insurance money would basically form this uh, happily ever after life for him. She thought they would get away with it, and that um, they would go on and spend the money and live happily ever after. And when the prosecutor asked Sabrina outright why she had killed Lisa, her answer left no doubt who was the murder's mastermind. I was doing what I was told to do. All right, and who told you to do that? Kevin. In fact, Sabrina claimed Kevin had even coached her on the way to do it. She said he showed Sabrina how to use the knife. And how did he show you how to do that? Stick it in and... It was powerful testimony. She was very certain in her answers. But was that because it was true? Or was it, as the defense suggested during cross-examination, simply because the deluded team believed it to be true? Under cross-examination, the defense team attempted to discredit Sabrina as a unstable, evil, psychotic woman. And given Sabrina's history, that might not be too hard. She admitted to bipolar disease. In fact, that was only the beginning of what she admitted during cross-examination. She testified she had heard voices. Not only was she hearing voices, but the voices were telling her to harm other people. And according to the defense, it was Sabrina's fragile mental state, not Kevin's manipulation, that led to Lisa's murder. Sabrina ultimately snapped. And when the case went to the jury on June 10th, it all came down to whose story they would believe. The man who'd lost his wife after six years of marriage, or the troubled teen who'd stabbed her almost 200 times. After two days of deliberations, the jury in Kevin Knafel's murder trial announced that it had reached a verdict on June 12, 2014. The 43-year-old truck driver was accused of masterminding the November 2012 murder of his wife, Lisa, by his then 18-year-old foster daughter, Sabrina Zunick. She had committed the murder so that they could be together. That's what she believed. At trial, the defense argued that the prosecution's entire case was nothing but a fantasy on the part of the mentally unstable team. The defense believed that these were just delusions in her head, that, you know, she fell in love with Kevin, but Kevin really didn't have anything to do with her, and it was just the way she was perceiving things. And with everything hinging upon Sabrina's testimony, the defense was confident of an acquittal when the verdict was read. I did not see how any person could find her credible, let alone credible enough beyond a reasonable doubt to convict Kevin Knafel. But in the end, the verdict was guilty on all 11 counts. When the verdict was read, I was elated. We were very emotional, and we cried and we hugged. The verdict was a vindication for Sabrina. We were aware that she had some issues and that she had some problems, but she was a very credible witness. And her testimony was enough to send Kevin to prison for a long, long time. Kevin was sentenced to life in prison with parole eligibility in 42 years. It'll be in his 80s before he's eligible. Although even that is too soon in some people's eyes. What Kevin did was pure evil. Taking advantage of a young girl to kill his wife. Today, that young girl sits in prison too. Per her prearranged deal with the prosecutors, she pled guilty to murder on August 28, 2014. Sabrina was sentenced to life with the possibility of parole after 30 years. Of course, some wonder if Kevin's plan wasn't for Sabrina to end up in prison, that perhaps he'd hoped the first officer at the scene would catch Sabrina, standing over her mother's body, clutching a deadly weapon. Had he made the decision to pull his trigger, Sabrina would have been killed, and none of this would have 